And welcome back to the JKR podcast. Today we have former five-star Midwest middle infielder and 2023 Wabash Valley signee Gavin Johnston on the JKR podcast for the Indiana Baseball Series. Gavin, pumped to have you on the show, man. How are you doing today? Doing awesome. Thank you for having me. Hey, of course, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, but before we dig into you know WVC, before we dig into Mount Vernon, five-star Midwest, I got one question I always like to ask everybody that gets on the JKR podcast, and that is... For those who don't know you, how would you introduce yourself? Who exactly is Gavin Johnston? You know, Gavin Johnston is just a family man who loves playing baseball. Um, you know, I take my family very seriously and love all the connections around me. And I just do baseball on the side. So, you know, I just kind of live my life and uh, do everything for the people around me, you know. Okay, so, perfect. Love that answer. Uh, but before – um, so to get us started, kind of the first topic I want to talk about – five-star Midwest. I know your travel baseball career, you know, has come to an end, but kind of take us through, you know, how you got connected with five-star um, just, you know, what that whole travel baseball experience has been like. Okay. So uh, I started off playing for the nitro, like when uh, stuff really got kicked up um, when travel baseball started to really matter, I guess. And uh, a couple things just kind of happened. I didn't like where I was in the spot with uh, the program. It's a really great program. I loved my time with them. They compete. They're a really good program, but, uh, just me personally, I wasn't where I wanted to be. And um, it was, I think, the summer of my sophomore year. I did no summer of my freshman year. I decided to uh, move on from them. And uh, we were looking kind of just looking around. And the ABC at Grand Park, you know, the, the really big uh, tournament over there, um, we were watching some games. And that five star team went to the championship for like the, the best bracket, it was like the gold bracket or something. And uh, it really sparked my interest because uh, to be in that position, I think they were playing a uh, like Cangelo C Sparks or something, and they just beat like Bulls Black, uh, Max Clark's team. And I was like, eh, they look really solid. So I kind of just reached out, reached out to the coach, and um, he was still in town, and he gave me a private tryout just at Finch Creek over here in uh, Noblesville. So after that, I just kind of went along with it and. It treated me really well over there and we competed and we were a really talented team. So it was kind of a, just, just a great experience. Yeah. So at what point in the timeline was that switch from nitro to five star? Um, fr- so sophomore summer, I was my first season playing with five star. I played in the okay. fall of my sophomore year. So I think that's when, when we got started. Okay. So getting the chance to play for, you know, two good programs there with the Indiana Nitro. I mean, they consistently have good ball players going to the next level, five-star Midwest as well. How would you maybe compare both of those experiences when it comes to just the day-to-day, game-to-game, what they both kind of look like? You know, just what's the comparison between those two programs? They were very similar, except I really liked being with people I didn't know from around this area, if that made sense. Okay. Um, I met a lot of I met a lot of new people with Five Star, and they were a bunch of kids from Cincinnati, like kind of all over the place. We had Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, West Virginia. It was kind of people from everywhere, and uh, I think the only thing that separates the two was just meeting people, getting new connections. You know, like uh, I felt like I, I kind of just made a family with with more people. Okay, uh, at like the game days, they were all pretty pretty similar. I felt like. Uh, I got along with my teammates better on five star than I did on nitro, but um, overall it was pretty, pretty much the same. Just both two top tier summer programs that just, you know, competed every day. It was pretty okay. much. So, so getting the chance to play for five star for a couple of summers, did you get to stick with that same head coach or does five star have it like similar to the bulls where it's like a cer- certain coach for each age group or how exactly does that work for five star? So yeah, five star, you get uh, one coach for like the age group, like when you're, I, I don't know. Um, exactly what age group they do it but um he sticks with you until you're done with the, the summer bowl the, okay that age group if that makes sense yeah now that we're done i think he's going to probably go to a younger age group okay so uh, with with five with you getting that chance to play for the same coach there for a couple of years there at five star you know what was that re- relationship that you built with you know your head coach but also maybe some other guys within that five star program and then even if you want to throw it back to the indiana nitro as well maybe some relationships you built with coaches there too. Just what does that look like? Just the relationships through travel baseball. Uh, well, coach Shaw, he was my uh, five-star coach. Um, he really helped me off the field more than on the field. I would say um, 
I was going through a hard period of time when I first got there my sophomore my sophomore season. And uh, he was just a bit, he was just a mentor for me. Um, anytime I needed to talk, talk to somebody or, you know, like if he noticed something on the field, I, I like uh, wasn't, wasn't letting the game come to me and just kind of letting all these outside, outside uh, like materials get in my head. Um, he'd always sit down and have a uh, man to man talk with me. And just the relationship I built with him was more than just baseball. It was like, it was personal. Okay. I, I have a really good relationship with him. And, I love that he took the approach to put me before the game and I really needed it because after that I started, you know, actually turning up and doing my thing. But before that, it was kind of just a mental, mental case during that summer. But um, he was also really good on the field, just sort of the relationship. It was a, uh, it was kind of half and half, like a, a coach and almost like a father figure. Um, so he was, he was really good to me. And then, um, some relationships from Nitro were uh, my 13 year coach is also very similar to that. Um, he was just kind of a really great guy. I mean, all the coaches that I've run into have seemed to be really good, really good dude. And you care more about the players than they do the baseball. And uh, I still talk to both of them to this day. Uh, one of them was my hitting coach over at PRP for a little bit. I don't see him as much anymore, but um, both, both really great people. Yeah. So looking so looking back into your travel baseball career, this can be, you know, again, Nitro, five star Midwest, whatever it happens to be looking back at your your travel baseball career and thinking about just maybe some of those favorite memories that come to mind, whether that's at Grand Park, maybe some relationships you made with some teammates. What are a couple of those just favorite memories that come to mind? My favorite memory for sure is going down to Myrtle Beach with my uh, Fishers Express team when we were 12. Uh, I think we went down there for a week and we were. Six, seven and oh going into the last day. And uh we unfortunately lost in the, the championship. But just the mix of you know being a kid playing baseball and you know hanging out with your friends on the beach. It was awesome. We got that we got to do a lot of stuff uh, other than baseball, and that was a really fun experience. Okay. I would go back and do it all over again a million times. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, it was it that was awesome. Okay. All right. So making the transition from travel baseball to high school baseball, you know, they're at Mount Vernon, like you said, what, 13 and two to start the year, kind sure. of take us through, you know, I obviously you had COVID there your freshman year, but take us through sophomore, junior year, and kind of so far here, this senior year, just what's that Mount Vernon experience been like so far? So I actually transferred from HSC when I was a, right after my sophomore season. So I was at Hamilton Southeastern my freshman and sophomore year. And then when I got there last year, uh, they kind of, Welcome me with open arms. It was really good hospitality and uh, everybody seemed to get along with me. And it was just kind of, it was really nice to, um, you know, go somewhere where you felt accepted, but uh, we ran into some problems. Uh, some teammates didn't like each other. Uh, there was a bunch of negativity going on in the dugout. We had a really, really talented team last year and didn't do much with it. Um, I think we were 17 and 10 and it, it was pretty much our own fault. Um, it's pretty much just the whole team. We had a couple groups of guys that didn't like each other. And if we would if we would have made the game about the team as a whole, I think we could have been really good. But uh, this year, it's just completely different. Uh, we all love each other. We, we go to war with each other every single day. And uh, it, you can really tell it speaks. Um, we get down, start off the game bad, you know, what, what whatever. Uh, we bounce back and... We, we really, uh, I think we got a really good shot later on in the year. Okay. So being a, so being a second year guy there at Mount Vernon, also being a senior heading to that next level, how have you maybe stepped up as a leader, kind of maybe taking some of these guys underneath your wing or whatever it happens to be, how have you stepped up as a leader here, your senior year, just trying to, you know, win as many games as possible and make it as far as possible in the May? Yeah, you know, I've really, I've really just stepped up, uh, trying to lead by example, um, I really tried to put the team first and I struggled for the first part of the season. So just making sure I was there for my teammates, you know, whenever they're doing well, I'm happy, you know, uh, not letting my own results shape the way of the game and, you know, just kind of showing everybody what, what a leader looks like. I've been just trying to, you know, be the most vocal guy in the room um, and just, just be like an outlight uh, to show everybody what it looks like, and, you know, not letting anything get in my head, just kind of, Head down, focus on one goal, one team. We have a really good uh, uh we have a we have a velo snake 
name's Cortez. Uh, so the culture that we're bringing to the, uh, the team is just awesome. We have our 12 you guys now with the Velo Snake, like the, the Marauder Baseball Club. They're all bringing around the Velo Snakes. So uh, it's just the culture that we're bringing to the, the team is awesome. So I'm yeah. just trying to be one of those guys to, you know, embrace it and make sure everybody, you know, comes along. So. Okay, so with that Mount Vernon team, obviously they have you going to a very, very good JUCO program there at WVC. DJ Schumann, Scheiman, he told me last week, I can't remember how to pronounce Shiman, it. Scheiman, yeah, Scheiman. Going to Ball State, Sullivan, yep. Notre Dame, Heitman, the, you know, the recent commit to Iowa, uh, Eli, Eli, however you say his last name as well. I'm, I'm terrible with last names. But, it's all good. It's all uh, good. But, well, you know, with all the, I mean, with you and on those other guys as well, you know, all going to very good next level programs um, after their high school careers are over. How do you kind of pick the brain of some of your teammates, some guys who have, you know, very similar mindsets, similar styles of play when it comes to, you know, going to that next level. How do you kind of pick the brains of some of your teammates who, you know, are also very, very good at baseball? Me and DJ, we hit together all the time. Um, We used to, in the off season, we were probably together five days a week. Um, So we go to the same hitting guy. And we really try to pick each other's brains. Just, you know, what are, what are we doing? Um, small little mechanical adjustments, small mental adjustments. We just kind of try to figure things out together. And us both being switch hitters, training at the same place, you know, every single day. Uh, we got a lot in common. And uh, it really helps having, having a guy uh, be there for you, you know, just being able to let you know what you're doing wrong, being able to, you know, keep you, keep you in check when you're getting, you know, what, whatever. Um, but we just kind of like to pick each other's brains on, you know, some intelligent, some in, in, intelligence stuff, I should say, just, uh, you know, maybe an approach. We're having a bad approach through the beginning of the season. Uh, we both gained a lot of power this off season. We got a lot stronger and uh, you can really tell we were trying to overswing both of us. So, you know, just kind of being there for each other to you know, remind you, remind ourselves to, you know, lock in, you know, that that's not the goal. The goal is not to hit a home run, you know, it's do something for the, do a job for the team. So we just kind of like to um, feed off one another. And then Eli Bridenfell is probably one of the best leaders I've ever met in my life. Um, The kid's taken on the role since he was about a sophomore. He started varsity as a sophomore. Um, Final four team, actually, they went to semi-state, played against Jasper. And he's really taken, he took on that role last year. So just, you know, seeing him and uh, see, seeing the way he leads, um, I like to pick his brain about how to be a better leader. And, um, you know, he, he overall just makes me a better person. So with Cam and Nick, um, they, they get their two ways here and there. They get, they get their swings in, but uh, they mostly just focus on pitching and rat packs and stuff. So I just kind of like to be there for him, uh, you know, on the mental side of things. But. Yeah. So, so, as, so as the spring keeps rolling, you keep going through your senior year, obviously hot start so far, 13 and two, but what are some of those expectations you have for yourself, but also for this team as the season keeps rolling, you guys, you know, are working your way into May. Um, honestly, I think everybody's got the same expectations. I think we fully expect to win sectionals, uh, win our conference, which both of those look really good right now. Um, win regionals, win semi-state. And then I, I think everybody's got expectations to win it all. Um, obviously that injury hurts us a little bit, but we know how talented we are and we know that uh, one player doesn't make or break this team. And I think we got a, we got a really good chance to make a really deep run. And for myself, I don't really have any like statistics that I, I like to go by. Um, ideally I'd like to, you know, hit 450, but it's a game of baseball. So it's really hard. Um, I like to just go up there every day and just, my hardest. That's really just my expectation. Just go out there and give them my all every single day. Whatever happens, it's going to happen. So um, I think one really like particular, uh, I guess, expectation for myself is to just stay healthy and compete. So going through your high school career, you said you went to HSE there for your freshman, sophomore year, transferred there to Mount Vernon. You know, yep. looking back onto both of both of those different uh, schools, just what are some of those favorite memories that come to mind when you think of high school baseball? There at HSE for, you know, that COVID year, sophomore year, and then, you know, these past two years there at Mount Vernon. Well, uh, this isn't my favorite, but I think I'll, I'll highlight this one because uh, they always give me a tough time about it. Um, so. Mount Vernon came to play. Their JV team came to play us when I was on the JV squad in 
sophomore year at HSC and they just obliterated us. So I get to hear about that about every day about how they, uh, it was was like, it was bad. It was bad. They just ran us right off the field. They renamed it Cam Sullivan field. Um, I think it was like a one hitter or something. He was throwing like 85, 86 on JV um, as a freshman. So I get to hear about that all the time. It's it's funny looking back at it. So that that's definitely a moment that sticks out. But I'd say probably my my favorite memory was I'd say winning conference outright last year. Um, it was just kind of a feeling you don't get it very often. Um, I wasn't used to it. I was a you know junior coming from a different school. Uh, I didn't get to play varsity baseball my first two years at HSC. I don't think we even won a conference championship throughout those years either. But um, it's just special, you know, being able to win something uh, for the school means a lot. So so I'd say that's probably my favorite memory is when we won at Yorktown. We clinched it out right at Yorktown. So that was awesome. All right. So going from, you know, Northern Indianapolis where you're there, HSE, I'm sure you guys are playing a lot of schools like Fisher, Zionsville. I mean, I believe you guys are all in that same conference and then going to Mount Vernon where I believe that's like, that's more like Northeast Indianapolis, correct? Um, It's like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. I mean, okay. I think HSC and Mount Vernon are probably like 15, 20 minutes away. Okay. So, so, so going, so going from, you know, HSE to Mount Vernon, facing all that, you know, top tier talent that Northern Indianapolis has, how would you explain the competition level here in Northern Indianapolis or even, you know, Indiana in general, when you guys are traveling to, you know, you mentioned Bedford, you mentioned some of those other schools you guys are traveling to. How would you explain this competition level here in the state? It's crazy. I, the, the talent here is, it's off the charts. And I think we don't get a lot of recognition for it. Um, I mean, we have the number one player in the country who lives about 45 minutes away. Um, the top tier arms everywhere you go, and everybody just keeps getting better. Um, even the younger guys, I've been seeing guys from Indiana up to 92, Parker Rhodes, he's in our conference. Um, I mean, just kids like that, it, it's everywhere. And there's another kid in our conference named Aiden Smith. He goes to Shelbyville, and he's up to like 90 as a freshman. So I, it's just – it's crazy. It's really crazy. And then you got teams like us, Zionsville, uh, Noblesville, Fishers, and just breed Division One talent. Um, I think you've got five, six at Zionsville. You've got five, four, five at our school. Um, more kids coming up. So it's just like everywhere you go, you find some dude. So it, it's really, it's really, it's really difficult. Yeah. But yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I. It's have- fun. It's fun. Oh, no, I, I'm uh, a lot better. 100%. Like, I, yeah. I grew up in Northeast Indiana. And obviously, if you really, if you, even if you look at it in today's classes, I mean, there's really not much, that much, you know, great talent coming from that area. So I can't, I can't imagine every game yeah. you're facing, you know, upper 80s, lower 90s. I'd be like, yeah, cute. But um, so you mentioned Parker Rhodes, who's in your conference. So I'm sure you faced him a couple of times. You said Cam Sullivan kind of shut you down there your sophomore year with a, with a one hitter when they came up there. So with you, going through these, you know, three years of playing Indiana high school baseball, who is the toughest AB or the toughest couple ABs, the toughest pitchers that you've had to face so far here in Indiana? Nick Heidman, it's not even close. Okay. What, Every, that, it, what live ABs? In, yeah, that, live ABs. Live ABs. We have an indoor facility. Um, it was gifted by like, a, I don't even remember, but it's really nice indoor turf. And Nick Heidman is disgusting. Okay. All right. Well, okay. So beyond, like, beyond guys on your team, okay. okay. beyond Heitman, I want to know who that toughest competitor has been in game. I'm going to have to think about this one. Parker Rhodes, not him. I haven't faced him yet. Oh, okay. Okay. I think we play them in two weeks. So. Wow, this is, this is difficult. I'm trying to think like summer. I'm trying. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try to give like an Indiana name. Hmm. Have you faced Jack Brown? Ricky Howell. Ricky Howell. Okay, he's a 25, right? 
No, he's 23. He's coming to Wabash Valley. He's like a dual commit with. Uh, oh, Wabash. yes. I saw that the other day because he's, yeah. he's a dual commit to WVC and IU, right? Yep. Okay. I'd say Ricky. Um, okay. grew up, we grew up playing against each other. Um, he was the kid that always threw really hard when we were young. And um, he's got some good stuff. Sucks because he's injured right now. It would have been a, a good to see him, you know, in conference. But yeah. So talking so so talking about WBC, let's go ahead. Let's kind of dig into that recruiting process. Kind of take us through, you know, when that recruiting process got started. You know, when was it that you know some teams started reaching out to you? So um, it was really my sophomore summer, junior summer, where I started to get people reaching out, but it felt like everything was kind of a dead end. Um, I had a bunch of Division One coaches you know, DM me, message me, you know, when, when we, uh, when is it junior, junior? Yeah. And start getting contacted. Um, yeah, it was around, it was around then. I had like three calls the first night that you can, you know, like talk to coaches, but it felt like everything just kind of like fell off. So it was like, you'd hear from them one time and then the next thing, you know, like you're ghosted, but then they'd reach out again and then you're ghosted. So it was it was really tough for me. It was like, it was kind of a struggle because it was like, well, I'm talking to this many coaches, but you know, where's this going to go? So it really started to pick up last summer when I started to get. Actually, it was no, it was the fall. I'd say the fall of this year. So I went to a couple. I went to a couple. I went on a couple visits, and Wabash Valley was actually my first offer my first official offer. And it was, it was just kind of a no brainer. Um, especially with the coaches, you know, kind of being all over the place. I didn't want to, I guess, go searching for more, um, which who knows, maybe if I would have done that, I would have, I would have ended up somewhere else, but I, I love the spot that I'm in that. I mean, the program is as good as it gets. I love coach Biddle. Um, he's a really great dude. Coach Mora. Um, gonna love working with them. So I think this is honestly the best fit for me personally. Um, a little under, a little undersized, a little underdeveloped, possibly a reason why I didn't fully get like anything really going. So just give me an extra one to two years to kind of develop and, uh, mature. I think it's a really good spot for me to be in. Yeah. So with you going to, with you going to JUCO and this is like, I haven't had very many JUCO guys come on the show. So I kind of want to get this mindset of you going into your freshman here this fall. I know obviously when you go to a WVC or a JUCO, like you spend two years there, you know, tried, like you, you said, Ricky's a dual commit to IU, you know, like, are you still going through that recruiting process for two years down the road or kind of what is that mindset when it kind of comes to finding that school beyond WVC? So yeah, it's, pretty much that it's pretty much like you have two more years to get recruited. Um, I think my, my, my mindset on, you know, where I'm going to end up is just kind of the same as it always was. Um, just kind of go play your game and see what happens. Uh, I don't really have like specific look on, you know, where I want to go yet, but uh, I'm just kind of going to, going to see where the wind takes me. Okay. Let's go there and compete and then see what happens. Okay, so before you got that WVC offer, obviously you said it was a great fit. You kind of you know knew it was a no brainer. But before that, you're talking to all those different schools. You know, kind of take us through what those initial conversations kind of look like. Did you kind of see a difference between schools? Did they all kind of did all these coaches kind of have the same mentality of going about it? What do those initial convos look like? Um, well, it always it always kind of starts off with just like an introduction, and uh, after so th- there was kind of like two two types of interactions that I would have. They would reach out and I had a couple of coaches ask me like if I was committed. Um, so like the first thing they'll ask is like, Hey, are you, you still on the board? And then, you know, you give like a short letter answer, you know, just reach out, thank, thank them for reaching out, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was always kind of small talk. Um, it never really got like deep into the conversation unless they were really interested. Um, I remember one coach, he was like, are you still committed? Or are, are you committed? And I was like, no, and just a short little answer. And then he invited me to a camp. So it, it's kind of it's kind of all over the place. But uh, when I really started to try and get recruited, I would send the coaches out just a video and just introduce myself. And um, after that, you know, I'd get a response or I wouldn't. And then 
when I did that, I started getting a lot more phone calls. Um, but like right when, right when junior year happened where you could contact coaches, first coaches that were like, Hey, Gavin, you know, so-and-so, uh, can we hop on a call later? So it was just kind of like right to the point, um, short, sweet. And then you hop on a call and I actually hopped on a call and then never heard from the coach again. Per- personality thing, maybe. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird. The recruiting process is very, very odd. Yeah. Maybe found a different guy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just really, it's really like questionable. You don't yeah. you really know what you're going to get. It's kind okay. of everywhere around. Um, and like coach Biddle at Wabash Valley was really interested. So he was like, Hey, let's get you out as soon as possible. So like I texted him, I sent him out my video, um, to introduce, introduce myself. He was like, Hey, can we hop on a call here in a couple of minutes? And I was like, yeah, of course. So we hopped on the call and then set up a date for me to get a visit. And that was it. Okay. So after, so after that visit, you know, how long, how long was it before you actually did commit and kind of knew that WVC was, you know, that no brainer that you said and knew, knew that was the place for you? Um, it's actually a funny story. Um, I wrote out my, I, I wrote it out like in my notes, like my commitment, see if it sounded right. So I did that the day after. Um, I did nobody knew about it besides me. It's, it's probably still in my notes, but I think when I, Called Coach Biddle was about two weeks afterwards, so it, it was pretty. It's pretty soon. You know, I sat down, kind of weighed my options. Um, I ended up not being able to play in the fall, so I was like, the fall was going to be really big for me. Uh, I got off to a really hot start. Actually, we played a we played a little scrimmage against five star ball team with like Cam Sullivan and all of them. Started off really hot, and then I unfortunately couldn't play the rest of the season. So I was kind of like, after that, you know, let's, let's, let's get it on the road. Yeah. So with you going to being an Indiana guy, going to WVC, obviously you mentioned Ricky earlier. I know Josh Adam Chesky, Matt Santana. I mean, I know Luke Dykeman just committed there as well. I mean, or yep. Dykeman, whatever. But I, I mean, I, what are some of those relationships that you have with some of your future teammates, guys who are, you know, in your 2023 signing class, maybe some guys who are freshmen, freshmen there now, what are some of those relationships you have with future WVC teammates? I'm brothers with a lot of them, honestly. Uh, I've known a lot of them for a long time. Uh, Matt Santana, I've known for a pretty long time. He's actually drove all the way from Lake Central, you know, the region. Um, I, I forget where he lives exactly, but he drove all the way from the region to come down and hang out with me. Um, we actually met through a mutual friend. His name's Cade Langhorst. He's going to Ball State. Um, we were over there at his house one time. And uh, other guys I've played with, so I have really good relationships with them already. Like Christian Brown, he goes to uh, Center Grove. We were on the same team for a couple of years. And then uh, I've got one of my five-star teammates going to Wabash Valley. Actually, two of my five-star teammates going to Wabash Valley. Um, so I, I'm brothers with a lot of kids that are going there. Uh, the relationship, we're just really good friends. We already have a really good, you know, upbringing coming. Uh, we're all getting to know each other. We got a group chat. So it's awesome. I love it. I, yeah. I love the kids there. So as, so as we talk about relationships, you know, we've talked about that coaching staff, coach Biddle, you know, just the, the conversations you've had with him, but you know, what is that relationship you have with Biddle, some of the other guys on that WVC coaching staff and how maybe it's evolved since you committed and, you know, have officially signed a WVC. Um, well, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty baseline. I'd say, um, I know they're busy, so I don't, I don't like to reach out all the time. I just kind of let us go, you know, our, our, our directions. Um, but it, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like, like, like a start off. It's kind of like a, a, at like a beginning stage, I should say. So, but they're, they're all really good people. And, uh, you know, I have no doubt that our relationship will continue to grow when I actually do get there, but um, I kind of just let them do their thing right now. And, yeah. You know, be kind of kind of mutual back and forth. I don't want to be one of those guys that's annoying them before I get to campus <laughs> all the time, yeah, making yeah, sure my scholarship's still there. <laughs> hey, coach, are we are we good to go? So I, I just kind of I just kind of let it roll. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, like you said, I mean, pretty busy. I mean, I believe on the last PG rankings I saw, I think they were like like number eight in the country when it comes to a JUCO program. So I'd say yeah, yeah you're, you're right. They are probably pretty busy, you know, winning games and stuff. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but la- I mean, last PG doesn't like us. What? 
EG doesn't like us very much. You know, like the coaches pull and everything they have. Yeah. Baseball, we're second, like in the. Oh, race. really? Okay. Yeah, and then PG just they don't like us. Yeah, see, I see, I see the PG JUCO rankings all the time. I guess I don't, I don't see the PG. I mean, the the JUCO rankings on any on many other pro uh, sites, but yeah. like I, yeah. I see it on PG all the time. And I was, I was like, oh shoot, like you know, WBC's in the top ten, but I guess I'll have yeah. to follow cl- uh, closer as the season winds down and they get you know maybe closer to a championship. But yeah. Um, Last baseball segment here. Kind of want to dig on to the on the field play. And then, like I said, like to end it off, we'll talk about the personal side of things like passions, motivation, stuff like that. But, you know, you are a shortstop and a second baseman. That's what it says on PBR. That's what it says on perfect game. Um, So what is that plan as you get to that next level? Like, are you planning on staying at shortstop, maybe moving over to second base? You know, what does that kind of look like? So as of now, the last time I talked to Bill, uh, he wants me to stay at shortstop. Uh, but we got to clean up the arm. I don't have the most powerful arm and at that next level, it's, it's huge to have the plus arm tool. Um, I got really good feet, really good actions in the field. So that's why he wants to keep me at short, but you know, my plan is just get on the field. If spots open at shortstop, I'll take it. If spots open at second base, I'll take it. If spots open at third base, I'll take it. Uh, Put me in the outfield. If you need me to, Um, I just try to be an athlete. So, you know, Whatever, whatever happens is going to happen, and I just, I just want to get on the field as soon as possible. So, okay. so my plan is to my plan is to stay at shortstop, but I've played both like my whole life. So whatever, whatever works. Okay, so with you playing both your whole life, you know, let's say you know you're looking at the lineup card, you're playing second base, you're playing shortstop. You know, is there a mindset change when you know you're on the left side of the bat compared to the right side? Like, what does that kind of look like? You know, just in terms of like you know playing two different spots there defensively. Uh, it's pretty subconscious, honestly. Like I move a lot better from shortstop, uh, but there is a little bit of a game plan at second base. You got a lot of time, so I kind of just try let the let the ball get to me. Um, sometimes that hurts me. I don't know why. I let the time thing kind of get in my head, and sometimes it ends up taking a bad hop. But like at shortstop, you know, you got to go. So I just make it. I just make the plays instinctually. You know, it's like if I see I, I'm running up to it, you know, whatever. But uh, I got. For the most part, just field ball and throw, <laughs> you know, just yeah. simple approach. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't, I don't overthink it too much. I just kind of go play my game, you know. Yeah. So flipping around to the hitting side of things, you know, what is that approach? You know, let's say you're on the on deck circle, you're walking up to the batter's box. What's going through your mind at that point? You know, what are you trying to do with each at bat? I'm just trying to attack. Um, early on in the season, I was very, very, very passive, and it it really hurt me. So uh, my mindset right now and my approach is just, just attack. Don't, don't strike out. Don't get the two strikes. Just, you know, get a bat on the ball. Um, I am really good when I put the ball in play. I think I, there's some stat that I've been looking up to try to help me, you know, uh, stop striking out. And my batting average of balls put in play is like 580 or something. So as long as I'm not striking out, like I'm pretty much getting the hit. So I just need to be – I'm just trying to be more aggressive and, you know, in that on deck circle, I'm just trying to get the pitcher timed up. Uh, but, you know, when in doubt, when I step in the box, I don't think about any of it. You know, I just compete. Um, if it, it, if it does get the two strikes, you know, I, I have a two strike approach. I have a two strike swing, you know, it, it's pretty much just shorten up. Um, I don't have a high, a high leg kick. You know, I barely lift my foot off the ground get into a shorter, like you've seen Juan Soto swing. I kind of have like getting my legs. It almost kind of looks like Max. You know, honestly, Max, you know, has the, he has his new like no wasted movement swing and it's awesome. I looked at that and it works. It's why he's the best player in the country. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but, you know, when in doubt, just go up there and compete. Yeah, I uh, no, I so I, I went to the Franklin Mooresville game twice this week. Obviously, you know, that whole. <laughs> You got Hogan, Denny, Hudson, Devon, Max Clark, uh, yeah. Brendan Oliver. Don't want to miss him out. And, you know, even Hogan's little brother, you know, tearing it up as a freshman. But yeah. I wanted to make sure I wanted to see those games. Both games I went to, I realized I feel like eight out of the nine guys in that Franklin lineup have now changed their batting stance to be pretty much exactly like Max. Yeah. Um, but it's, I mean, it, no, I like I was talking to some like so there were some travel ball coaches there watching. I was talking to them about it. They were like, well, yeah, like, you know, this and that, you know, I, obviously, you know, I'm a big baseball guy. I'm trying to be an agent, this and that. I don't know the maybe the whole logistics of, you know, hitting mechanics, maybe. But they're, you know, explaining to me, you know, like you just said, no wasted movements kind of gets it right to the point. 
Um, yep. But as you kind of dig into, as you talk about mechanics, let's kind of dig into that. If you kind of take us through what your mechanics kind of look like, maybe how they've evolved over time, maybe going to that no no wasted movement kind of mechanics. Um, and is it the, is it going to be the same for you as a lefty, for you as a righty? Just kind of take us through those mechanics. Okay, so I'll start off by saying I, I haven't switch hit my whole life. Um, I started when I was actually 12. So it's been a, uh, a grind. Um, my left-handed swing when I was 12 years old was terrible. Um, it has evolved just to an extent that I honestly can't even, I can't even comprehend. Um, it's honestly taken over my right-handed swing, which should be how a switch hitter is. You know, you should have probably the left side, you know, the one you're going to use more, be better than your right side. But as far as mechanics go, I start my hands, you know, pretty high up here in my, like, you know, shoulder area. Um, I have kind of like a hinge in my back hip. So when I get into my load, you know, I make sure I get into that hip. Um, try to land 50, 50, you know, weight distribution is a big thing for me. And, um, try to make sure, you know, my body's just as square as possible. And then, uh, I like to rotate, rotate behind. Um, it's a big thing that I've gotten a lot better at. Um, I used to, you know, stride out, start leaking, leaking forward and everything, just make sure I rotate behind me. And, uh, we've been working on, uh, it's not really like a teacher man thing, but it's the, you know, Mike Shirley, I, who I work with, one of my hitting coaches, um, he says like the bat should be parallel in like when it, when it's the bat should be parallel to the ground behind you. So like being able to snap that barrel behind you and get on plane as early as possible. Uh, that's a big thing for me, left-handed and then right-handed has always been natural to me. So I kind of just swing. Um, my mechanics are, they're, they're pretty similar. I don't sink as much on the right side. Um, I have more of a kind of just a leg lift and put it down, uh, lefty. I have more of like a hinge and ride, if that makes sense. Um, but the mechanics part from five years ago to now is just crazy. Yeah. So you said you you decided to become a switch hitter there when you were twelve. Unlike yeah. you know some other guys who are switch hitters, where they pick a bat pick up a bat left hand and that's just you know what what they plan on doing. Yeah. For you, like you know, where does that where does that uh, mindset where where does that decision come from to become you know not just a right handed hitter but you know try to become a switch hitter at twelve years old? Where does that decision come from? It honestly didn't come from me. <laughs> it, it came from my dad. It, it was like. When I was young, I'd always pick up a bat and just mess around swinging left-handed, and it was never bad. So my dad just had me work on it for a long time, and until I got comfortable enough to start swinging in game, I would like if we were up big and you know I, I'd already had a good game, I'd just switch over to the left side, just taking that one at bat left-handed. So that started when I was twelve years old, and I was smashing baseballs. I think one game, like one game. I hit a double to the wall. I was like, dad, I need to hit left-handed. So it, it was kind of, kind of started off as a joke. Like if we were winning big, you know, then I'd hit left-handed in the game. And then I felt like I could be good at it and I'm all about the challenges. So I wanted to challenge myself to be able to do it. And the older I got, the more me and my dad realized, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool that not very many people have. I think it's an added tool to like, you know, six tool athlete. I think if you're a switch here, it kind of gives you like a tick. So I always knew it would be good for recruiting if I could, you know, become a switch hitting middle infielder. Yeah. So it was kind of just something we messed around with. And then me and my dad kind of just, you know, came to the conclusion that why not? Yeah. So you mentioned, you mentioned Mike Shirley there. He is the White Sox, White Sox scout, correct? Yep. That's, him. That's what I yep. thought. So for you going and, you know, having him as your hitting instructor, you know, being in the building a relationship with a guy who's, you know, scouted guys for years, you know, so far up there in that White Sox system. How do you kind of pick the brain of a guy like that going through maybe some different drills that he's taking you through going to his facility? Just, you know, how do you pick the brain of a guy who has so much experience, you know, working with minor league ball players, working with just professional ball players in general? How do you kind of pick his brain? Um, I really just try to listen to everything he says. You know, um, everything he says is 
directed with a purpose. And I just try to make sure I consume as much knowledge as possible. I know he's a busy guy. There's times where I've texted him and it takes him a long time to respond. So I just make sure that I'm, I'm in the right line with him when we're together, you know? Um, so we're, we're always in a group of like 10. I think my group had some absurd number of good players. I mean, you know, Nick was in my class. Uh, Colin Lindsay was in my class, you know, a bunch of just big name guys. Um, Max was in my class. <laughs> so it, it's just like, we all know he's the best around. Um, just asking a bunch of questions. Uh, that's one thing I, I like to do to pick a brain is just ask a lot of questions because I'm not afraid to do so. And the more information you get, the better, you know, the better player you're going to become. Yeah. It's, it's really nice having that in your back pocket. Yeah. So as you talk about your dad, as you talk about Coach Shirley, and obviously with you going to a great program like Mount Vernon, signed to Wabash Valley, one of the best Jucos around, I'm sure you've had, you know, a bunch of influential people within your career. But if you could choose maybe two to three people who have been the most influential within your career, you know, who would those people be? And what, you know, what would be the reasonings for them being so influential? Um, honestly, I just have one and just be my brother. Um, I watched him grow up playing the game and, uh, you know, he's, he's done a lot for me. So he introduced me to the game. He's shown me the ways of the game and, uh, just watching him grow up, become a division one athlete, go to pitch at a big school. It, it was awesome. So I always wanted to kind of follow in his footsteps and, you know, you that brotherly competition, you know, I always tried to be better than him. You know, I always want to be better than him. So, you know, just my brother in general has just been awesome. It's, it's yeah. great to have somebody like that in your life. Yeah. So as you go through, you know, the rest of your senior year, go through this summer and then get to that next level there at Wabash Valley. If you kind of had to put an emphasis within something within your development, you know, what would be that key thing you're wanting to work on within your development? I would probably say my run tool. Um, my run or my arm tool is probably the weakest of all the tools that I have. I run like a six, nine right now. Um, I think I'm right now. I'm probably, but I'm probably up to like six eight. Um, but you know, if I could run a six five, I would be a just completely different ball player. So, trying to figure out how to do that, and then also if I want to stay on the left side of the infield, you know, I got to be able to throw the ball harder. And also that gives you other options. You know, if you throw the ball hard, um, you you can get moved to left, right, center field. You know, you got the arm from the outfield. Uh, you can play third base, and if all if all goes wrong, you, you can pitch. So I think that would, that would probably have to be my top because I think I'm like 84 across the infield. But that's like when I'm throwing the ball as hard as I can. So it's just, it, it's just a really nice tool to have. <laughs> the honest, yeah. You can yeah. throw it really hard. It's just a really nice tool to have. So I'd probably say that probably my heart. Okay. So you kind of dug into what my, you know, my last baseball question would have been, but I guess well, I'll just ask it and see if you want to go a little bit further into it. If you were a scout watching your game, you know, what would be that personal scouting report you'd write up on yourself, just the entirety of it? You know, you're hitting, you're base running, you're fielding. Um, um, I guess, yeah, those three. Um, yeah. If you were a scout watching your game, you know, what would be that personal scouting report? Honestly, uh, just I'm not a power guy. Um, I can hit a couple home runs here and there, but uh, I live gap to gap. I hit a lot of doubles, hit a lot of triples. Um, so I kind of just slash all over from both sides. Uh, right hand has got a little bit more power, but nothing too special. Uh, hit pretty much every pitch. Um, the, the IQ, the IQ is there. Uh, I think I'm a really smart baseball player. Um, I may not be the most talented, but I, I think I'm really smart on the base paths, you know, just in the game, you know, knowing what's going on. And then as far as, as, far as the field tool goes, it kind of just plays. Um, it's nothing too special. I'm not no Javier Baez, but it, it's it, it's good. It's really good. Um, I don't make a lot of errors. Can't throw very hard, but you know I'm a quick guy. Make plays fast, and that's that's pretty much it. Okay. All right. So my last segment here for you. Like I said, I want to end off more of the personal side of things. First question here, let's dig into passion. So beyond the game of baseball, let's say you know you want to cope with some stress, take your mind off of the game, or take your mind off of something else. What are some of those passions that you have? Golf. Okay. Golf. I'm a big golf guy. I love playing golf. 
especially, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about the left-handed swing because I can't swing golf club left-handed. So I like going out there to the links, playing with my brother, you know, my friends. Um, that's that's really big for me. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Just hanging out with my friends. I like to do, I like to do a lot of normal, nor, normal stuff. Yeah. So do you do you think is it, do you think it's a myth that the golf swing messes with the baseball swing? I think it depends. I think it depends on the person and the player. Um, I do think to an extent. I, I don't know. I can answer for myself. Yeah. I, I can say no, it doesn't for me. But I have seen people that you know go golfing and cannot swing a baseball bat the next day. So I'd say it honestly just depends on the the person. Okay. But yeah, for me, no. All right. Yeah, Cause when, when I was growing up, I mean, I, I didn't start playing golf till, you know, once I hit college, like my, my, my mom and dad are like, if you want your swing to, you know, stay the way it is, like you, you got to make sure you're not golfing. So I, yeah. I did not buy a golf club, went golfing, what, whatever. until after my baseball career was over, I was like, I got to make sure that, you know, I can't be messing up and, you know, yeah, going you can't mess up your swing. Than, going yeah. over for the next game after I go golfing. But um, yeah. Um, so next question here, you know, motivations, you know, what is it deep down internally that helps you, you know, get out of bed every morning, helps you continuously evolve as a ball player, as a person, just what are some of those motivations that you have? You know, I'm blessed. We're blessed to be, to be alive. Um, you know, I, I, I always go back to this one quote is like, you know, if I gave you $10 million, how would you feel? And, you know, everybody responds with amazing. Nobody could bring you down for a long time. But then if I tell you, you know, you got $10 million, but you can't wake up tomorrow, are you still taking the $10 million? Everybody, everybody's answer is no. You know, waking up tomorrow is more important than any type of money or anything. So, you know, just waking up each and every day, I'm blessed. And, you know, just the motivation is just being here. I mean, the chances are very slim. And uh, I get to do a lot of things that a lot of people don't get to do. Yeah. So, you know, just being able to wake up each and every day is a blessing in and of itself. So it's so, my only motivation. So taking that question a little bit further, let's say, you know, perfect picture, 20 years down the road, everything's going right for, you know, you can finish, you know, to wake up the ne- that next day, you know, what is that perfect picture of your life here in 20 years from now? Um, so I'd be 38. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> if everything, if everything goes to plan, I'd love to be retired, you know, just done with everything. Um, have a family, beautiful family. Uh, live in a beautiful house. Have a, you know, I, I'd like to say a couple houses. Let's have a couple houses. Yeah. yeah. You know, always got to shoot big. Uh, you know, have one here in, you know, Fishers, McCordsville, Fortville. And then, you know, have a couple here and there, maybe one out of the country or something. But uh, yeah, I'm, I, I hope in 20 years I'm retired and don't have to worry about anything and just live the rest of my days out like I want. There we go. Good, good goal right there to have, you know, a couple yes, of houses, maybe, yes, maybe a couple houses in different countries, but yeah. Hey, uh, that would that'd be awesome. <laughs> but no, I got, I got two final questions here for you. I'll just ask them back to back. That way you got them both go to yeah. playlist. You know, we just talked about, you know, that long drive to Bedford. What's that go to playlist on a long road trip, you know, genre singer, whatever, however you want to go about it. You know, what's that go to playlist and final question dream NIL brand. So you get the opportunity to capitalize, to collaborate, endorse, or partner with any brand in the United States or, you know, other, whatever in the world, you know, what would be that dream NIL brand? Okay. So for the first question, I think my the top playlist has got to be, you know, it depends on my mood, honestly. Like one day I could, you know, really be into rap. Next day I could really be into, you know, uh, country music. Um, Free game, I listen to a bunch of different songs. So it just kind of depends. Uh, I'd say, like, the mood that I'm in today, I'd have to go with, you know, some Morgan Wallen. And that's that's that, that's it. Yeah, he's got he's got one hell of a new album. I've been uh, – Yeah, yeah, that's – I don't think yeah. I've listened to many other songs beyond those 36 in the past couple of weeks. Nope, nope. I'd have to say right now. Um, and then the dream NIL deal would probably have to just be like Nike. I mean, let's be real. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the second Nike. That's the second Nike I've gotten today already. I, uh, really? my last interview, cause on Sundays, you know, obviously with you guys playing ball every night throughout the week, I got a 
you know, yeah. you know on Sundays with all these interviews. So yeah. uh, two out of three today, Nike. I think someone else said like Chipotle or something, but okay. uh, Nike, well, that's... Nike's got to be the the most answered, the most, the biggest answer for that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, I couldn't even think of a brand, so I was just like, throw it out there, Nike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, if if you have a, if you have some sort of endorsement deal with Nike, I mean, you're doing something right. But hmm. uh, but no, man, that's of course that that's the final question here for you on the J Care podcast. You know, really appreciate you coming on the show. I do wish you the the wish. I want to wish you the best of luck. You know, as you go through the rest of your senior year, you know, head to Wabash Valley and then beyond that, where where you end up going. Just best of luck for the rest of your career. And again, you know, just thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.